Hello friends and welcome back to the series on uh, ECG learning. So this will be a short video, but uh, I can tell you that after the end of this video, you will not have a confusion on how to determine the cardiac excess or the excess of QRS on an ECG. Sure, short. You won't have a doubt ever. And before we specifically talk about that thing, uh, let's recall the hexaxial reference system that I taught you in the last video. If you haven't seen that video first, of course, I encourage you to see that video. But this is the uh, uh, the different uh, ECG leads, the limb leads that represent the frontal plane or the coronal plane in which the uh, cardiac activity, the electrical activity is depicted. So remember the orientation of these leads and remember that they are numbered from zero degree. First of all, going clockwise, um, uh, they're numbered to plus 180 degree on down side and then um, minus to minus 180 degree from the, up, um, the from the top side. And again, I said that's purely irrational. This is how it's been made conventionally. I want you to remember the leads one points to zero degree. The positive pole points to zero degree. Uh, positive pole of limb, uh, this lead two uh, points to plus 60 degree. Lead three points to plus 120 degree. And similarly, lead AVR points to minus 150 degree. So please don't confuse this point. Uh, it's written minus 150 degree. It doesn't mean that the lead AVR negative pole is uh, pointing to that side. No. This is the positive pole of AVR lead. But in terms of this reference system, as a hexaxial reference system, it's written as minus 150. Okay. And similarly, AVL, it's written minus 130. Minus 30. It doesn't mean that this is the negative pole of this lead. Okay. So don't confuse these things. Now, coming to the actual topic, that is how to determine QRS axis. This is the simple rule that you have to remember. Look at two, look at lead one and look at lead AVF. These are the two leads that you'll have to look. Lead one and lead AVF, nothing else. So now just draw a quadrant system. You've seen this hexaxial reference system. Imagine in the form of four quadrants from zero to plus 90, then from plus 90 to plus 180 or from plus 180 to minus 90. So these four quadrants that are shaded in green in this picture. So now if both lead one and lead AVF are predominantly positive. So remember the lead one positive pole is zero. Lead AVF, the positive pole is plus 90 degree. If they both are positive, so remember the vectors of your physics in your class 11th. So if both are positive, the axis lies somewhere in this quadrant from zero to plus 90, the bottom right quadrant. Now the second scenario in which lead one is predominantly positive and lead AVF is negative. Again, remember the vectorial concept. One is positive, so it has to fall to the right of this midline AVF is negative, it has to fall above this 0 to 180 degree line. So it lies in this right upper quadrant. Similarly, if one is negative and AVF is positive, just imagine one is negative, AVF is positive, so it is this lower left quadrant. And of course, if both are negative, then this upper left quadrant. So basically, by just looking at these two leads, you're at least aware of the quadrant where the cardiac axis lies. Okay, so if you have forgotten this concept, what cardiac axis is, it is the average or the mean vector of overall cardiac electrical activity. And uh, we have to know its direction. So using this rule, it's kind of a simple table to remember a simple concept, look at lead one, look at lead AVF which is positive, which is negative, you can easily figure out where and in which quadrant does the cardiac axis lie. So now the next step will be to, to tell the exact degree where exactly in this quadrant or where exactly in this quadrant does it lie. Now for that, I again uh, want you to remember the simple uh, rule from vectors again. See, if the electrical activity travels towards the positive pole of a lead, of an electrode, that lead will record a, predom a positive deflection, a positive deflection. You call it an R in, in ECG. On the other hand, if the electrical impulse travels away from the positive pole of a lead, or in other words, towards the negative pole of that lead, the ECG will record a predominantly negative complex. On the other hand, 
if the cardiac impulse is perpendicular to a lead, it's neither directed to its positive pole, it's neither directed to its negative pole, it is just perpendicular to that lead, that lead will record an equiphasic. It will have a positive part, a negative part. In fact, they will cancel each other. This is uh, based on the vector principles that you've learned in, before joining medical school. So this concept we will use in getting the exact degree where the cardiac axis lies. So the simple formula is that look at the limb lead where the QRS complex is equiphasic. Because once you know that, you know that the cardiac axis is perpendicular to that lead. So take a look at this example of an ECG. So first of all, let's locate the quadrant. Lead one is positive. Lead AVF is positive. So I can tell that it lies in this quadrant because both of them are positive. Lead one is positive. Lead AVF is positive. It's a right lower quadrant. Now to find the exact degree of the cardiac axis, look at the lead where it's equiphasic. So as we can see, it's the lead AVL where the complex is equiphasic. There's an R, there's an S, they're of equal amplitude, but in opposite directions. So this lead, um, so just recognize this lead and then you know that the actual cardiac axis is perpendicular to AVL. So what is perpendicular to AVL which lies in this quadrant? It is, so we know it's minus 30 here, AVL. So perpendicular to that in this quadrant is plus 60. So in this situation, the cardiac axis is directed exactly perpendicular to the lead AVL, which is why it is equiphasic and therefore it lies at plus 60 degree. So using this rule, you locate it in step number one, the quadrant where the cardiac axis lies. And in the step number two, this perpendicular rule, you can tell the exact degree at which the cardiac axis lies. So this was the uh, purpose of this video. And then you can find in your standard textbooks, you can easily remember that the normal cardiac axis is between minus 30 degree to plus 90 degree, highlighted in pink in this picture. Then uh, if it's more negative than minus 30, this is the left axis deviation. That's from minus 30 degree to minus 90 degree. Then if it's uh, more positive than plus 90, that's from plus 90 to plus 180. This will be right axis deviation. This is the northwest axis or extreme axis deviation. This video will not cover the causes of uh, left axis, causes of right axis, causes of this extreme axis deviation. You can easily uh, see those in the form of table in your book. and Maybe you can cover in the next videos. But the purpose of this video was to be clear. So practically, how do you how do you know the cardiac axis or the axis of the QRS complex? Now, to end this video, I want to tell you why the ECG looks the way it is. You know, why is that V1 looks like this? Because this is how a normal EC, this QRS complex looks in V1. And this is how a normal QRS complex looks in V6. So why do they look like this? So for that, you need to know the sequence of depolarization of the heart. So please remember that the action potential or the cardiac impulse initially depolarizes the interventricular septum. Specifically, it depolarizes the septum from left to right. Now, this is an oversimplification. I'm not like making things hard. It is just, see, ECG is just pattern recognition. I'm not telling you the details of all this thing. I'm just telling you how to recognize these patterns. So the initial depolarization is from the left to the right side of the septum. So remember the right oriented lead, which is V1, it's to the right of the sternum. Remember, it will record a positive deflection. And the left oriented lead, which is lead V6, will record a negative deflection, a Q. Okay. And this is followed by depolarization of the other parts of the heart. Right. So which means the paraseptal area of the right ventricle, the paraseptal area of the left ventricle, and then the free wall of the left ventricle, free wall of the right ventricle. Now, remember that the muscular mass of left ventricle is huge as compared to the right ventricle, which means it will be the dominant player. You know, the electricity that left ventricle will generate that will overshadow. It will mask the electrical impulse that generated in the right ventricle so the next vector that i've drawn is purely from right to left the depolarization that results from left ventricular free wall activation remember it's not just the left ventricle that's getting depolarized of course right ventricle is also getting depolarized but i've not drawn that vector because that's mostly cancelled by the big vector of the left ventricular free wall activation so this vector is pointing from right to left 
which is why the right oriented lead will record a negative complex which is an s wave and the left oriented leads will record a positive complex which is an r wave so now you understand why in v1 the normal qrs complex looks like a small r caused by this initial septal depolarization and then a deep s caused by this left free wall free wall of the left ventricle depolarization and on a similar pattern why the v v6 complex or v5 lead complex looks like this a small q and then a tall r and this is the reason why this q is called septal q wave because it's produced by the depolarization of the septum from the left to the right and that is why the left leads record a negative complex or q small q wave and then a tall r wave which represents the depolarization of the larger part the free wall of the left ventricle so that finishes today's video we'll see um, um, you in the next video which will deal with some of the other things of ecg these videos will be basic stuff and once we finish all this we'll of course go into more advanced stuff on ecg thank you